All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm going to give it a um, about two, three minutes to allow people to log in, and then we'll go and we'll get started. This also gives me a time to put it as a watch party. Right. Well, thank you for tuning in this evening and for those who will tune in and watch this later at a later time. Um, tonight's uh, marital resilience, we're going to focus on communication and events and hidden issues. And uh, there'll be some exercises. And um, so just encourage you to grab your notepad, pencil, pen and write some things down and um, later on if you watch this and, and want the material you can always stop by reach out um, and let us know so you can follow along with the material so we'll, we'll start off with um, communication and I know we've touched on it um, in our other in our other marital resiliency sessions. And then we're gonna go a little bit deeper tonight on that. And so the first question I ask you is, what is good communication? And I want you to ponder on that for a minute and think about a specific example of good communication. Focus on a time when you and your spouse you and a friend or you and a family member communicated well. Consider what in that conversation made it possible for good communication to take place. And so for those um, that are here that will watch later, page two of your handout um, talks about that on the, in, in the speaker listener technique, but ingredients to good communication. All right, so what makes good communication? Um, potential, you know, it, potential response that someone might have is making good eye contact. Good eye contact, um, it's good, it's part of good communication. Um, letting the speaker complete their thought. In other words, not interrupting the person that is speaking, um, and this often happens. Um, not insulting, right? We don't want to insult each other. Not just walking away, right? That doesn't solve, or, or that's not communication when somebody has their back turned to you, or when, or when somebody's in the kitchen and you're in the living room and you're communicating and giving vital instructions about what needs to happen next week, right? That's not good communication. 
but actually listening to one another, right? And this is where the speaker-listener technique comes in. And it's, uh, it's a proven way um, to really communicate and letting one speak while the other while the other listens. So, um, there's a speaker and there's a listener. Um, with the speaker-listener technique, there's rules, right? There's rules. There's rules to make communication work appropriately. Um, you want to speak for yourself. Um, oftentimes, we are mind reading and, and trying to form a solution, a form a response to, to what, what we are listening to, right? Um, but with the speaker-listener technique, you want to speak for yourself and don't mind read. And then keep statements brief. Um, you ever talk to somebody that keeps, just keeps on rambling and rambling and rambling and, and rambling and, and um, when that happens, a lot of information is missed or um, uh, there's, um, how do you say, sometimes there's blurred communication, a lack of clarity in is what is being said. So you want the listener to be able to, to respond and, and in other words, when you're speaking, you want to have those pauses to make sure that the person that is listening um, understands. And um, how do we know that the other person understands? By, by letting the other person paraphrase, right? Um, paraphrase. And then the listener, you know, you paraphrases what they hear and they focus on the speaker's message. Um, not forming a rebuttal or not forming a solution. That's later on in the communication process. The first part of communication is getting things off your chest, right? And speaking about what, what disagreement or what's going on um, in your life. So, um, I want you to take the time now um, to, um, and I know you don't, you might not have it in front of you, but just take the time um, with your spouse to kind of practice these things. Um, and I, and I want to give you um, some to a topic, and I want you to practice the speaker-listener technique. Um, and put. Let's, let's say um, we just celebrated Pi Day on uh, three, March 14th. And so, cake or pie, right? Now, and, I, and I want you to, one is the speaker, one is the listener, and then you're gonna, and then you're gonna flop switch and listen, paraphrase um, while the speaker is talking and um, what is it for you? Is it cake or pie? Which one's your, your, um, your preferred dessert? And so let's take about uh, five minutes to do that.
So um, for those of you who just logged in, we are doing uh, we're doing an exercise right now. It's the speaker listener technique. Um, and so um, one is taking the uh, the the time to to speak and and um, and then we're gonna we're gonna switch um, in doing that at the three minute mark where the other person will speak and the other one will listen paraphrase um, and focus on the speaker's message Yes, at this time you'll be switching the three minute mark. All right, how was that um, exercise? You can leave your comments or any, any concerns or any comments and we'll, um, we'll get to your questions as we, as we go along. Um, hopefully that, and, 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 it, and just to let you know, it takes practice using um, this technique. It's, it's a form, it's a structure to use. I know we are comfortable in communicating um, the way that we do. Um, in relationships that you might feel comfortable the way you communicate in your relationship. This is just a way to communicate um, and to um, give some techniques and to make communication, help communication to be better, not accusatory, not, not judgmental, but um, to communicate because when you're accusatory, judgmental, that's when communication Someone is shutting down, right? And communication shuts down. So we want to keep communication flowing, right? So let's talk about skillful speaking and listening. The first rule is to speak for yourself, right? Um, speak about what you are encountering, what you are feeling. You're not speaking about the issue. You're speaking about how you feel about what happened. 
right? And why, why the difference? Oftentimes when we communicate, we just want to go to problem solving. And a lot of times problem solving, yeah, it, it might get you to a solution, but at the end of the day, has real communication happened? Because it, not, it might not be a viable solution to the problem. It might just be what you think is the solution, but then you have the other person with their own thoughts, their own feelings, that are struggling with your solution because it doesn't fit their framework. And so, what you wanna do is speak for yourself. Don't mind read, right? And I tell people I, I've been married, what, going on 25 years this November, um, I'm not a good mind reader, right? We have to, don't just assume your husband, your spouse knows what you are saying. And that's where the paraphrasing comes in, right? Don't just assume that. You want clear, concise communication. Yes, I understand. Okay, I got it. We have to pay this bill by Friday. Okay, right? Um, and that's the paraphrasing part of it. So one way to make sure that you're speaking for yourself is to use what are called I statements. You know, and you might ask yourself, what are I statements, right? You're speaking, in other words, you are speaking for yourself, right? Not for your spouse, right? So why I statements, right? I'm gonna give you three reasons why. They keep the listener from feeling attacked, right? They keep the speaker from mind reading and they keep communication specific, right? Because oftentimes when you're coming to the table talking about something, um, it's not about, you know, problem solving is, you're, you're gonna get there, right? But in order to problem solve, there has to be an understanding of what each other are, feel, are feeling, right? Or, or what's going on inside. And so, um, let's take a moment to practice some I statements. So let me read you a scenario, and then, and then I want you to think about how you would rephrase um, what is being said here into an I statement. So scenario one, Tony and Allison regularly argue about money. Times are tough, and Tony is especially upset about a surprise charge on the couple's credit card. Wasn't planned for, right? In his frustration, he says, you just don't care about the budget. So you can see how that statement can cause friction and potential for argument. So how could Tony rephrase this statement into a non-accusatory to allow communication to flow. So one, one I statement Tony could say is, I feel frustrated that you aren't following the budget, right? Now here Tony is talking about how he feels, I feel frustrated that this is going on, right? It's not accusatory. The other person hasn't shut down about it. Okay, it allows that other person to say, you know what, okay, well. All right, Tony. You know, so that's one way, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go to scenario two. After returning from work Saturday afternoon, Laura noticed that Oscar had not mowed the lawn like he said he would. She told him, you're being lazy today. Mm. Now, you can see the gloves are on and the tempers are flaring and, and the evening is um, probably not gonna be a good one, right? So how could Laura say that in a way that is non-accusatory using I statements, right? Laura could say, I've, 
Oscar, I feel like you don't respect me, or I, I don't feel respected because the lawn is not cut. Mm. Right. Or I, I feel like you didn't really listen to me, you know, when I'm sitting here and, and the lawn is not, is not cut. So you see how it, um, it leads to a place, okay, well, now I'm understanding um, what, what you're communicating, what's going through, exactly. through your mind, right? So this is a way of kind of diffusing your frustration um, and communicating in a way um, that dialogue can happen. Um, and maybe it might take you time to <coughs> calm down before you speak, right? Or take a shower or walk around the block or, you know, whatever, before you really... Um, just blurt out um, these things, right? So communication is about thinking and speaking, not just speaking in anger um, or off the cuff, just lashing out. So just, you know, just in effective communication, skillful speaking is half the battle, right? We talked about it. We use the speaker-listener technique. You want to be skillful in your talk, right? And that's just one example of how to do it. Now, now let's focus on effective listening. And let's specifically focus on paraphrasing. So when, when we talk about paraphrasing, people, oftentimes people think that that's just being a parrot, right? Seen those par you never had a parrot or seen a the parrot, they're just parroting back what they hear. That's, that's really not... Um, paraphrasing, right? It's not that. Instead, it's all about tuning in to what your partner is saying and feeling. Um, now, nowadays, we have uh, um, phones, and, and a lot of times we're communicating while driving or communicating vital instructions, doing other things, and oftentimes that's not effective communication. Why? Because we talked about it, the posture for communication, right? Eye contact, being able to hear, um, what, 80%, every 80% of communication is what? Facial cues, nonverbals, right? Nonverbals. And so when you communicate, you want to communicate eye to eye, right? Um, don't start using the speaker listener technique while you're, you know, miles away or on phone. This is good to use while you're face to face. It's not, it's not good to argue about things really over the phone because you're not really, you, you, you're already down. You know, you already <laughs> lost that battle or, you know, and I wouldn't even call it a battle, but you just lost already because you're, you're missing an essential part of communication. So what is paraphrasing, right? And I'm, I'm going to give you some, some thoughts about this. It's a new skill for, for many, right? Um, because oftentimes what we are hearing is not what the speaker is saying. And so in order to clarify that, you want to be able to paraphrase. So I'm hearing you say such, right? It sounds like you are feeling or saying this, right? So from your point of view, um, and let me see if I got this. You are, those are um, some phrases, sentence starters for, um, for paraphrasing. So, so let's, let's, we're going to do some, some more practice, practice on this, right? So let's, let's do an activity here. Practice sharing a concern. So for this second practice, I'd like you each to think about a topic of concern you'd like to share with your partner. I want to be really clear. While you should pick something that you have concerns about, please do not choose something that is a source of conflict between you, between the two of you. 
right? We don't want to go into conflict. We just want to talk about some concerns. Maybe Johnny not cleaning his room or Susie not taking out the trash. You know, something, something of concern. Um, and use what you've learned so far. Yes, let's um, it's six minutes, three minutes a piece, minutes. right? One is talking, the other one's okay, listening, okay. paraphrasing, and then we're switching. At this point, you should be switching.
how was that exercise? Hopefully, um, it was uh, beneficial. Practice mm -hmm. makes perfect. And so now I want to talk to you about four communication danger signs. Um, there are danger signs with communication that we want to be aware of. Um, and oftentimes we are looking at our our spouse and, and aware of these, but we have to be aware of them within ourselves. And um, at first, right, because we are part of um, the solution, right? So invalidation is one communication danger sign. Um, An invalidation really is putting down the thoughts, opinions, or the character of others. Start invalidating, I guarantee you communication is going to either shut down or escalate into something you don't want it to, to be. So just be careful of invalidating another person um, in the communication process. So don't put down the thoughts, opinions, or characters of others. Right. Escalation, responding back and forth negatively with each other. If escalation is happening in the conversation, um, things are going to get heated. It's probably a good time to call a timeout and say, you know what, let's revisit this and talk about this um, at a later time. And um, usually when escalation is going forth, one person withdraws um, automatically. So with, how can we show that we are withdrawing in communication, right? And we talked about this, the 80% um, non-verbals, right? So our facial cues, the way we look, you know, you know, we can invalidate by our facial expressions. Like, we don't have to say it. We can say, you know. So just watch that in your communication, right? Um, because oftentimes we're thinking it and we're expressing it. And if you're thinking and expressing it, you're basically saying it even though it's not coming out of your mouth. So unwillingness to get into or stay with the important discussion. Um, oftentimes when it gets, you know, when, um, when couples talk about something that, uh, that is very dear and near um, or something that is affecting the relationship, one of those hard topics, Usually one person doesn't want to go there, they withdraw, right? And so um, that's, a com that's a danger sign when, and, and it could be that you're, that other person's not willing or doesn't want to discuss it. Um, and often we say, well, in, in time they might, and that's possibly true, but when you're at the table and you're using the speaker-listener technique and, and you're talking about, um, important subjects, you don't just want to get up and, and withdraw and just get up from the table and walk away, yeah. right? You want to have that, you know what, uh, before you walk away, you know what, this is not going anywhere. Um, let's, can we please come back and um, revisit this at a later time? And then there's negative interpretation, right? And, and, and just think about that for a minute. Like we're, we're hearing what the person is saying, but already in our mind we are forming a defense or we're taking it negative, negatively and responding in, um, in a bad way, in an unproductive way. So what is negative interpretation? It's making a negative and unfair assumption, right? assumptions, about what someone is saying, thinking, or doing. And so it's important to and that's where paraphrasing comes in, right? Or listening, not, not assuming, but asking those questions. So I'm hearing you say, so when you say this, what do you exactly mean uh, when this is being said? So, and the speaker-listener technique helps to kind of, in, kind of uh, neutralize these communication danger signs. Because um, if you're insulting your partner, you're not using the technique, right? <laughs> uh, you should probably call a timeout. Um, if, you're, if, if it's escalating, slow down the conversation. Helps keep the emotional pot from boiling over. Um, if you're withdrawing, we, you know, we tend to withdraw from conversation when it doesn't feel safe. 
Um, the speaker listener technique keeps a conversation safe so the withdrawer can open up and say what they need to say. And then paraphrasing helps with negative interpretation. And we want to watch those danger signs in the way we, the way we operate, in the way we, the way we communicate. Right. Um, and, and you know, there's there's concerns about speaker listener technique. You know, well, it feels fake. Well, just think of it as a way of communicate communicating. It may feel awkward to you. Um, right now, but you start think about it. You're you're starting to to use it and put it into place, um, and so practice makes perfect. So um, we talked a little bit about calling a timeout, but um, part of that is knowing each other and really setting the rules. Um, rules and dialogue for communication beforehand, right? Because you know in relationships there's going to be those friction points, there's going to be those, those discussions that, and, and some are easy to discuss, some are hard, but setting those rules right now beforehand and so you can have some structure or some kind of um, game plan on how to discuss these things. Because in a relationship, the mutual understanding and the love flowing, it should be to understand each other, right? That's the goal, that's the solution. I mean, that's the goal, that's, that's the goal here, right? Solution, problem solving, comes after the understanding of, of what each other are saying, right? And a lot of times, the other person doesn't want you to solve the issue, right? Maybe the issue's not solvable. Um, after one discussion and maybe it takes two or three right so just having the patience to walk up and okay we're making some progress we're understanding each other um, and and maybe later on they'll you know we'll come to a conclusion a solution so um, right now we're going to talk about uh, when the speaker listener technique is most most valuable right so in communication, right, there's, there's intensity levels. We can get into intensity levels, right? Low intensity situations need normal talk. You know the saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? And then you get to moderate intensity situations, right? In other words, if it isn't working, try the speaker listener technique. And then high intensity situation, when it's high, when you've reached high intensity, it's time to, hey, call it timeout, <laughs> you know, it's, it's escalating, it's not a safe um, environment. And usually at the high intensity levels, you are not thinking clearly, it's the fight or flight, you're reacting instead of really listening, um, you're in defensive mode, it's name calling and it usually leads to domestic violence. And that's, you, the t speaker listener technique at that point is thrown out the window, right? So, you, you know, you don't want to take it to that, to that level. Um, oftentimes people don't know how to communicate properly, so they let things fester and they let things build up. And, and maybe you're this type of person that you let things build up and then you just spill it out, right? And then your spouse is like wondering like, What's going on here, right? So, um, you want you you know, you want the dialogue, right? While you're at, you know, a level that you can think, think clearly. So, and um, what I mean by fight or flight is that your body goes into a state of you know your adrenaline, your your your. your your blood pressure boils, and then, and then what is your body doing trying to get you back to a state of equilibrium, a state of where your heart's not palpitating, you're not sweating, you're not, you know. So just, just think about that, right? Any system that is over, overburdened, overwhelmed, is trying to seek 
equilibrium stability. And so just understand that and understand that within yourself. You don't want to let things build up. You want to talk about them, right? So are there any questions or um, any concerns at this time? Or All right, well, let's take a, um, this time, let's take a 10-minute uh, break, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with the, last, with the last session for the evening. What time is it right now? Um, so 6.50?
gathering back now. Um, this um, second session we're going to discuss um, events, issues, and hidden issues, right? Um, and we all, we all have issues, right? <laughs> we all have issues. So, every couple, every relationship has issues in their relationship. In other words, there are, there are, there is potential to disagree about any number of things. There are problems that need solutions, and there are problems that aren't solved but understood. Right? And we talked a little bit about that oftentimes. We're not trying to solve, we're just trying to understand because the problem is too, too big to solve um, at the time. So, all of these things can cause conflict in relationship. So what are some events, what are some examples of events in relationships um, that, that can cause um, problems? How about seeing an overfull trash can? Having to stay late at work unexpectedly. Uh, being surprised by dishes piled up in the sink. Noticing a low balance in the bank account. Driving in traffic. Right? Choosing where to go on a date. Or even choosing where to eat tonight, you know, or eat. Or, um, so these are events, right? And oftentimes as Couples, we focus on the event and don't really get to the issues, right? Um, you might be talking about the dishes, right, or the laundry, but what is that causing, right? That's just surface. That's just an event. Oh, we want to get down to what really is the issue, right? So... What matters most is dealing with conflict in a healthy way. So, you know, a lot of people think, you know, because there's issues in relationships, you know, that, you know, relationships, it's not working well, right? Every relationship has issues, events, has problems. And it's not the problems, right? It's the way we handle them that become problems, right? Really. So, um, we're going to focus on on that, right? How we handle the conflict. So, three layers, right? There's three layers here. We, we, we talked about, I've mentioned it in the title, events, which are on the surface, right? Surface level. Then there's issues, right? They're the next layer. And they're deeper, hidden issues. Right, which we oftentimes in conversation and dialogue really don't dive into that molten lava of hidden issues, right? We don't want to go there. We keep it at surface level. And we find ourselves arguing all the time about surface stuff. The grass not cut. The, this has not happened. This is not taken on. You know, just, just, just understand that, right? And if you're stuck at events, you're not really going to progress until you go down to the deeper layer. So an event is the trigger of how the argument got started, right? What triggers an argument in your relationship? Well, we talked about some of those things. Trash can might, you know, might not be taken out or dishes not washed, laundry not done. Um, um, hard day at work, you're coming home, the house is a mess. Those are some examples of surface level stuff, right? And often, you know, we, we, you know, we feel better if the other person does it, you know, and, and the other person might, or child, or, you know, husband, or spouse might by fear, or by just keeping you quiet, just go ahead and do it. But there's really not an understanding of why the task um, or why this makes, oh, we just know, oh, this makes my, my, my spouse happy, and so let's do this, but we don't really understand why. 
Um, you know, my, my five-year-old asked me, you know, uh, Dad, you ask too many why questions, right? Because I'm trying to get to the understand my son and get down to the level of really understanding why he's reacting a certain way or why he's upset or happy, you know, really getting down to understanding. So, we all know that events do not occur at convenient times, right? <laughs> Oftentimes, they do not com occur at convenient times to deal with issues. We're just putting a patch on it, right? A patch on the Titanic. <laughs> you know? But we know eventually the Titanic's gonna sink, right? So, just understand that, right? Events sometimes just happen. And if they trigger, they, and they trigger issues, right? So, um, and oftentimes it might, might be better just to take time out than just reacting to, to an event. Um, so, and then transitioning to the middle layer, right? The issues. So we, under, we establish events happen all the time. There are stuff of life, life happens, things happen, right? But what are those, um, those hidden, I mean, not hidden issues, but issues, right? We're talking about the second, the second layer here, right? And issues are the problems for your relationship, right? It could be money, it could be chores, work and school, relatives, friends, communication. Um, those are the real, you know, the issues, right, that, that, that need to be addressed. So, and when it gets to issues, it can lead to, to more conflict, deeper conflict, right? So, and then you can use the, uh, you know, with, with these issues, um, are they being spoken about, right? Are they being dialogued about? Are they being talked about, right? If you have a concern with money um, in the relationship, right? And oftentimes, you know, when, when we come to the table to discuss things, we got, we got our Santa Claus bag, right? We got our Santa Claus bag of money, the relatives, the in-laws, the outlaws, the kids, and we just wanna slam that uh, Santa Claus bag on the table and say, here it is, let's fix it, let's sort through this stuff and come to a solution. Well, now you've brought like a calculus mathematical problem to the table, um, which many of us are not good at math to solve that, right? So, and, and you know, I, I like math, um, but in order to solve a big math problem, you have to know how to solve the lowest common denominator of the problem, right? Um, how do we swallow an elephant? A bite at a time. So what am I saying? Don't, don't, it, it, don't just bring all these things to the table um, when, you know, when is a good time to talk about issues? We know events are going to happen, you know, sometimes we're, are, we're pushing the wrong way and, 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 and we're flustered with these events that happen. Um, not a good time to talk about issues, right? You want to talk about the issues when things are going well, right? When you know, look, money is an issue in our relationship, right? And so, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Well, um, well, you know, if I do that, then it's going to ruin the mood. Well, when is a better time to talk about it? Um, it's not when you're upset, right? And it's not when you're ready to slam it all on the table. So you want to talk about these things. Um, and maybe, you know, one week, the conversation's about money. You know, and maybe uh, you might not be able to come to a solution at that time, but maybe, you know, each other's, you know, feel, feel like they're, 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 they're being heard and they're being understood. And then you pause for a minute, you know, come back and revisit it. Okay, now let's talk about this. You know, um, let's talk about chores in the home. Or, um, and so you, you want to 
talk about these things a little at a time and not fluster yourself with the end goal and not get anywhere. So, and these are below the surface things, right, that fuel some of these, some of our passion for the surface level events that happen. And we, you know, we want to be mindful of that. So, we talked about, you know, communication, common issues, relatives, jealousy, career, school, chores, social media. Social media right now, it's, you know, we've gone to a place of COVID and um, social media has been a problem for a while now since its inception and, um, but the, you know, the amount of time spent on there and so that's, that's a problem in a relationship, that's an issue. So, now we're gonna talk about some hidden issues. We're gonna get down to the nitty gritty, right? So, and why, why do I say that, right? Um, we know um, even today, right, a lot of us use gasoline in our cars, right? Well, where does gasoline come from, right? Remember the dinosaur age and fossil, they're called fossil fuels, right? The breaking down the, you know, the, the consum you know, the breaking down of fossils in the earth's surface and they become what? Oil, you know? Oil, and we use that oil to, to what? To fuel production of car, you know, what, what is this guy talking about and why is he bringing this up, right? Because we know that down deep, there is what? Wells of water, right? If we tap into wells, we can have what? A geyser or, or you know, or water, you know. How, how do the plants live in the desert, right? What am I saying? In beneath the surface of who you are as a person and, and the events that, that, that might trigger you or those issues on the deep, you know, on the, on the other level and underneath all of that, if you peel the onion, there are hidden issues in your life. And oftentimes, those hidden issues are not spoken of, right? Um, um, and sometimes they're not even recognized in within us. Um, we all grow up in, in different families and different traditions and different ways of doing things. And, and, and yeah, we, 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 we've seen on TV the Cosbys and, 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 and the Waltons, and, and I'm dating myself here. Um, and now I don't know what they're, what they're showing. The model of a family, um, even today, is confusing. And so, um, just what is normal, you know, what is normality in a, in a family, right? And, and what's normal in one family might not be in the other, right? Because you're taking two people, you're combining them, they, they have their hidden issues inside of them that maybe they've, they've not really have control of or talked about. So, hidden issues are fundamental human needs. We all have what? Human needs, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna list, list 10 of them. First one is caring. People need to feel like there is someone who is interested in, <coughs> looks out for, and helps them. They need to be cared for, right? Uh, number two, they need to be accepted. Uh, people need to feel like there is someone who knows them for who they really are, both good and bad, and still values them as a person. They need to feel accepted. Um, and then there's control. People need to feel like they're not being forced to do things. Oftentimes in, in relationships, there's manipulation, right? Um, and then you have power. People need to feel that they have the ability to decide on and do things on their own. Then you have love. People need to feel like there's someone profoundly interested in their well-being, not only wanting the best for them, but actively working to bring those things about. And then there's integrity, number six. People need to feel like their words and actions align with their morals and belief systems. Then number seven, people need respect. 
to feel like they're being treated with the dignity they deserve as a human being. And then there's a number eight, commitment. People need to feel like there's someone they can rely on to be there for them no matter what, right? And then number nine, trust. People need to feel that the other will follow through on agreements, right? And then there's recognition. People need to feel like their efforts and achievements are noticed and valued. So the goal here is not to have your partner meet or solve your hidden issues, right? Um, instead, practice talking safely about them and why they are important. And also do your part to better understand and make it safe for your partner to share their hidden issues, right? And out of the 10 things that I've mentioned, you know, maybe in your life there's one or two or three that are hot button topics for you, right? There's things that push you to, oh, wait a minute, I am now feeling disrespected. Or maybe you value integrity as a person. You were taught to do what's right. Um, and a lot of this goes with the person's personality and understanding their personality and how they view life. But those, those are things that we ought to understand when you are dating, when you are courting, when you are growing in the relationship, right? Understanding what motivates someone to be at their best. Um, and that's the no of relationships, right? Um, if you stop in your relationship really knowing each other, then, then you're cheating yourself. You haven't really arrived, right? And why do I say, oh, well, I've been married this long and I should know. Well, wait a minute, there's stages of life, right? Stages of life and at those stages of life, there's different priorities, there's different needs, you know, there's different things that, 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 that inspire a person, right? They become more mature. And so understanding that, um, that understanding the no of each other. And that's why communication is the basis of understanding the no um, and understanding those hidden issues. So we do not mean unknowable or unconscious, right? because they're knowable to the person, right? They're not unconscious. So what we mean here that there's a deeper core of themes that often add the greatest energy to conflicts, but these are not what couples tend to talk about, right? Hidden issues are often the big drive of intense conflicts, but they are not often directly discussed, right? So, just think about that. Um, a lot of times these hidden issues drive decision making. Right. Okay. What is driving decision making um, in, in your life, right? You might value family. And so every time, guess what? Your decision making, that's, that's a hidden issue for you, right? It could be commitment. It could be trust. Right? Love right there, right? And so when you're making these decisions, it's gonna be, you're going to be fueled by that, right? But the other person might be fueled by other things like acceptance, right? I, I don't, you know, okay, I, I know where you are, but I just need you to know, I just need to feel like you accept and you're hearing what I'm saying. You might not agree with it, but so we have to understand that in each other and, and what best best way um, than to know that within ourselves and to talk about these things. So um, I, I, I just want you to take, take some time here to think about, think about these 10 things, caring, acceptance, control, power, love, integrity, respect, commitment, trust, recognition. And I, and, 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 and I want you to think about maybe write down two or three of them or, or make a mental note in your mind of what really fuels you. What really are those, those hidden issues? Those, and, and when we think about hidden issues as something negative, no, I'm not saying that. 
I'm saying that these are things that fuel you, that, that kind of guide your, 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 your compass in life and, and kind of push you. Um, and so just, just think about that for a minute. could be more than one but you know I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and, and you know for myself it would be you know integrity and you know, people need to you know for me I have a deep my, my morals and beliefs are guided by the word of the Lord and so I expect people to do what's right in church out of church right so j just think about that and then respect you know um, people um, and, and, and what does that mean? And, 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 and so I, I, I use this example um, a lot of times, like say for instance, um, um, you, that, that respect, it's a hidden issue, right? But on the surface level, how does that respect come up to the surface, right? It could be an event. Oh, well, the dishes are not washed and the house is not clean. And so then it's, that, that really shouldn't be bothering me at the surface level, right? But then, you, then, but then you go on down deeper into what's really fueling me that's really bothering me about these things, right? It could be respect. Oh, wait a minute. When the dishes are not washed or this is not done, I feel disrespected. And so that fuels my, okay, well, this is going on here, and it fuels the momentum for the discussion or the talk about why these things are not taking place. And so understanding about that about ourselves can give some insight on the things that really, really cause conflict in the relationship. And then it is, okay, what am I going to do? You know, maybe my, you know, you know, my spouse or my loved one can't can't meet those needs, right, at this time, at this stage of life. And, but I understand that that's what, what is going on. And, 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 and why do I say that? Because oftentimes understanding, having knowledge about it can help you to de-escalate and not be frustrated about, about things that are happening, right? So, and then it might not be your spouse's priority either. Um, so it might be other things are going on. So there are four signs that you have hidden issues, right? And, and I talked about it a little bit about the first one is spinning your wheels. Think about the arguments, the discussions, your frustrations that maybe were not voiced within the last week or two, right? Things that have happened in your relationship. Right in the last two weeks, I'm not asking you to go back to go back to Egypt. Right, I'm talking about the last the last two weeks. Right, and ask you know, have you been spinning your wheels? Right, spinning your wheels is when you think, here we go again. <laughs> you know, this is the same argument we've had a million times. <laughs> right, that's spinning your wheels. And then there's trivial triggers is when a small thing turns into a big argument, right? And your emotions are out of proportion, unbalanced to the event. You're losing it because somebody forgot to put the milk back in the fridge, right? So trivial triggers, right? That lets you know that there's hidden issues. There's things that are bubbling up to the surface that you need to put your finger on, right, and really acknowledge that it's there and maybe begin to work that within yourself. Um, third, you avoid talking about some things as it were a disease. You run away from it, like COVID, right? You don't want to talk about it. You're running away, like, no, nah, 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 no, uh, I want to talk about this right now. 
And then, number four, you're keeping a score, right? Like it's a football, basketball game. You keep track of all the negative things your partner does. Writing it down in your mental, in your mental notebook, right? Or in your note section of your phone or something, right? You're writing all these negative things. Um, to make sure you bring this list of negative things in the next argument. Bringing it up. We are, you know, and that often happens in relationships, right? We think that, you know, we go lucha libre style, right? No holds barred. We, we're bringing up Egypt and Moses, and he's dead. Moses is gone and dead. And we're bringing up uh, whoever, you know, bringing it up. And wait a minute, I thought we've gotten past all this stuff. And so. Those are, you know, the keeping score. And so that lets you know that there's hidden issues that need to be addressed. And, and let's be honest with ourselves. Um, and let's get down to what's really fueling us. So let, let me give you an example how events, issues, and hidden issues spill into conflict. Well, this is a, a story. A couple, let's call them Joe and Nate and Nadi. Nadi, Nadi gets a notice by email of an overdraft charge. And this triggers a conflict about the issue of money, something this couple has had ongoing problems managing as a team. The conflict over money is intense because one of the partners has an extra strong need for control, while the other has deep concerns about trust. So you understand how this triggers what is going on here. So, so let's, uh, let's discuss something here. So why do you think we react with more intensity to some hidden issues than others? Well, for some, you know, those are not being met or haven't been met as well as others, right? Those, those needs haven't been met. Childhood experiences, right? Previous relationships. We have higher expectations than our partner about certain hidden issues. So if we take the time to better understand our own hidden issues, how might that help us? So by understanding, we might react with less intensity right? um, when an event triggers an issue. And when couples are, are able to talk openly about hidden issues that are getting triggered, they can build a deeper connection, or understanding each other's deeper needs and fears. So. How have you handled the hidden issues? Or, or maybe it's come to your surface and to your knowledge right now, but just when you feel yourself getting upset over things, just keep that, keep that in, 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 in your mind. What's fueling this in me? What is really going on with me? Because my, my spouse, my partner seems to be unaffected by this. So I know it's not their issue, it's mine, right? Oftentimes we are blaming somebody else because we fail to look in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm the problem, you know? Maybe the way I'm reacting to this is, is you know, out of control, so. So to recognize a hidden issue means that we not only name it, but that we accept that the feeling exists. We don't have to like hidden issues, agree with them or rationalize them. We simply have to understand them, right? So recognizing them, unhiding them. Don't hide them. Talk about them. Um, my wife and I were talking today. She, you know, uncovered a hidden 
hidden issue. You know, family is important to me, right? Um, and so, where does that, you know, where does that stem from? You know, what, where is that coming from, right? Th these are coming from what she's been taught, what she's been instilled in her life, and it drives uh, um, some of those decisions. And I talked about myself, integrity, right? Doing what's right. Why does it bother me when people are doing evil? You know, because they know better. You know? They know not to do that. You know? And so we just have to understand that, right? What motivates us? What really, um, and, and I know I'm, I'm belaboring this, but this is very important um, to understand that in relationship. Because if you don't, you're going to be spinning your wheels. You're going to be upset at every, you know, trivial triggers. You're going to avoid talking about it. You're going to run from conversations because you don't want to go there to the La Brea tar pits where oil is being produced, right? You don't want to go down there. And then scorekeeping, you're keeping score and you dump it all on your partner and nothing's been solved. You just threw up on them and you left a mess. So <laughs> we want to dig deeper and digging deeper takes work and maybe you're not seeing it or maybe you're not understanding, but um, Family Life Center available. Um, you can reach out. We are here for you to help you succeed in life, learn some skills, better yourself, become the better version of you. And to become the better version of you, you have to look in the mirror, right? And say, you know what? I need to improve or develop skills to improve yourself because oftentimes you can't, you know, you're spinning your wheels trying to change your partner. You're not getting anywhere, right? Because that's not the intent of relationships to change one another, right? The intent of relationship is to grow in what attracted to you, find the commonality of what attracted you to each other because opposites attract and finding commonality and moving forward in that commonality and growing as individuals, right? So just understand that. Um, and I know that um, we're ending early here, which is a good thing for many of you because you have many things to do. Um, but thank you for attending, for being part of this. If you would like the material, you can always reach out um, to the Family Life Center, 913-680-7336. Um, here for you, provide counseling. Um, and we'll be doing uh, more of these um, events and hopefully in person as COVID subsides um, so we can obtain a greater impact and connection. And know that you're not alone, right? You're not alone. People have been married and, and, grown, you know, and, and, and have gotten through this, right? And if others have, have been married for a long time, you can get through this too, right? So be encouraged and uh, we are here for you. Thank you for attending this evening, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs>